start. Um, but here we are, chapter nine, the family after birth. So we're going to go through some definitions. We're going to talk about some different, essentially, stages of care, some different cultural beliefs. I'm going to make fun of your book a little bit. Um, and then we will talk about changes in maternal systems and the nursing care associated with those changes. Uh, we'll talk about the different interventions that you will do for the woman who has a C-section, um, explain the emotional needs of a woman right after birth, and recognize the needs of a grieving parent. The pure purium. How many of you have heard of that before? Okay, cool. I see one head nod. Was that, that was before recently, though, I'm guessing. Oh, no, that was when I was doing my post care project okay. yesterday. Okay then. So recently it is. Um, I was just guessing that you might have heard that around at NIH. But yep, no, it's not really a common term that you'll hear. Um, you'll hear a lot immediate uh, postpartum period or immediate postbirth period, infant period. Um, the six weeks after birth are the quote unquote fourth trimester another word for it but really postpartum period is what you're going to hear most frequently um, partum being separation of the mother and baby post being afterwards um, so <clears throat> cultural influences on par uh, postpartum care this is incredibly important in our area because we do have a mix of probably four or five different major cultural groups and each group has somewhat different um, cultural practices surrounding birth. Some are a little bit more private, some are a little bit more communal or familial. Um, so really, at the end of the day, you can all guess what I'm about to say, respect your patient's cultural belief that your care starts with an assessment of what their needs are and where they're at. So talk to them about their birth, what's worrying them. Those will give you clues about what their views are. What's their big concern? How do you address the patient-centered problem, the person's uh, stated concern, um, generally that's one that will be the intersection of their health and their cultural values and practices. Um, if the patient is not English speaking as their primary language, you should be offering them an interpreter. I know that we're always trying to finagle our way out of the legal requirement that our patients have that legal right to have an interpreter. This is the last situation where you want to be finagling out of it. The woman giving birth is not the one that should be using the family translator. I get that sometimes for convenience, okay, you're giving a flu shot, you know, have them explain the flu shot consent, boom, okay, yeah, no harm, no foul. When you're having somebody for hours needing to communicate your need, that is com or their needs, that is completely different. Um, so it's very important if the patient cannot communicate effectively in English that they have a translator and that plan is made for them. And the responsibility is not on the patient. It's on the healthcare provider. And ultimately, congrats, that falls on us nurses. <clears throat> All right, so postpartum changes. Um, immediately after delivery, mother experiences multiple physiologic changes. So it's important for the nurse to be assessing all of the body systems and not just focus on reproductive systems. Um, who can guess what system I'm going to start talking about first? Based on. Hmm? Yes, circulation. So you have a woman that has way, way, way more blood in her, in her circulatory system than usual because she needs to support a baby, and that baby is going to exit out, and then all that blood is going to start slowly exiting out as well, not necessarily through hemorrhaging, but as your kidneys filter out fluid and those red blood cells die off. And what happens is your body also has the uh, compensating ability to contract blood vessels, but that is slower than the drop from your body not producing red blood cells anymore and from um, bleeding and labor and from all these different changes that are happening. So really, one of our biggest concerns is shock. It's lack of circulation of oxygen to the essential organs in the woman's body. 
So I know we've talked about a couple of different things um, that affect body systems in pregnancy. For example, gestational diabetes and the way that it affects the pancreas and insulin sensitivity. So these are things where you've had kind of consistent, long, gradual changes, and then all of a sudden you have a precipitous reverse, something that it's in the opposite direction. You're having all these, having a baby changes, and then the baby's gone. Uh, so you need to anticipate that this is something that will cause severe hormonal changes for the woman, which can affect blood sugar, which can affect mood, can affect overall psychiatric condition, postpartum depression becomes a big concern. Um, so the real highlight here is you're not just looking at, oh, is the uterus boggy? Yes, we will be talking about palpating the uterus to make sure that she's not going to hemorrhage or is hemorrhaging inside and just not bleeding out so we don't know it yet. That is important, yes. But in all things, do not get tunnel vision and forget you are taking care of a whole person. So you have your priority number one. And as soon as you know that that's something that's addressed, then you start looking, okay, what are our other big priorities? Triage. Uh, let's see. Data collection is a good time to teach the new mother on normal changes versus those that require reporting to her healthcare provider. So for example, you take her blood pressure and you say, this is a normal blood pressure. If it's over this amount, go talk to your doctor. Um, all right, adaptation of nursing care after C-section birth. Essentially, for the most part, things are changed except your patient just had a minor surgical procedure. Um, really, that's the end of it. You still have to look out for almost all of the changes related to delivery. They still had a baby just pulled out of them. Just because it wasn't a quote unquote natural birth doesn't mean that all the changes of having that baby haven't happened. Um, generally, your job is going to be monitoring dressings. Um, lochia, there's generally going to be less flow afterwards. You can guess why. There's just physically, you know, there's less stuff that has been pushed through the vaginal canal. So there's less stuff that's going to be kind of falling through afterwards. Um, urinary catheter, so the mother will likely have a urinary catheter for a while, and that's a nursing care uh, issue. Um, respiratory care, that is a big one too. I know I've already talked to you a little bit about fluid, but auscultate the lower lobes of your mother's lungs. Make sure they are not getting fluid accumula accumulation, atelectasis, just because we're giving them too much IV fluid. Uh, that's something that happens. We want to keep them hydrated. That's important. Yes, but it is also very easy to once we're using IV hydration overshoot the mark and then do more harm than good, especially if you just had a C-section. So um, respiratory care, if they have any difficulty, if they've had any um, respiratory involvement, like I've just mentioned, you can have them do incentive spirometry. I've even, I'm not going to demonstrate it because it is well loved, um, <laughs> but here we are with our wonderful, I keep it around just to demonstrate. It's important to use. It's you inhale through it, not exhale. So you take a deep breath out all the way, and then you inhale, trying to keep the little dot in the happy face. It's got a little diagram that shows you which way the air goes when you're using the tube. So it's very easy to use. Um, honestly, the big thing with that is just it's language agnostic. So it doesn't matter if you're teaching in English, Spanish, or any other language, you can show them the pictures and demonstrate and it's fairly easy to communicate without uh, needing the same verbal vocabulary. Um, but again, yeah, I just have this solely to bug all of you and shake it around and say, I know you don't want to make your patients do this because they don't want to do it. Make them do it. It's very important. Um, <clears throat> all right. Prevention of thrombophlebitis. So this was Brittany mentioned, what's my big concern going to be? She said circulation and relating to clots. Yes. Clotting is huge. So you have somebody who maybe all their life has been a pretty decent, oh, I like to get up every morning and walk. And then, you know, she gets real close to her um, birthing time and maybe she's, excuse me, in her last week not really doing as much walking. And then all of a sudden she needs a C-section and she's in bed for several days. This is somebody who's never in bed. 
this is something their body is not at all used to. So their blood is just kind of chilling and pooling. That's not what we want. Um, so you need to be mindful of clotting. Um, we need to be looking at clotting risk factors. And if there are significant risk factors, you can be looking at physical deterrence, like using the sequential compression devices, those pump, pump, pump things that all the patients hate. Or you can be looking at using the TED hose, the stockings that all the patients hate. Or maybe pharmaceutical means like heparin, the injections in the stomach that all the patients hate. You can see there's a consistent theme, but dying is a lot worse than getting a shot in your belly. Um, all right, and then finally, pain management. You should be expecting a little bit more pain for someone who just had a C-section. And by a little bit, let's see, vaginal birth. I'm not a woman, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably really, really, really painful. And like, you know, isn't it like a transformative experience? Okay, well, C-section that is cutting through the entire midsection of your abdominal wall. And I do have one of those. And that sounds also like transformatively painful experience to me. Um, honestly, for women that are undergoing the C-section, it's really the time afterwards for them. It's the recovery and trying to have that musculature uh, grow back together and heal without too much scarring. Um, that's going to be the time that the pain management is crucial. When the cutting is actually happening, she's going to be all doped up and nerve blocked, yada, 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 ideally. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not, oh, we sewed you back up so it doesn't hurt anymore. No, it's going to hurt, ache, be terrible until that's grown all back together. And unless we get it to grow back together, right, it's probably going to ache indefinitely. Um, so that's where it becomes very, very important to be teaching healthy exercises and pain management strategies. All right, emotional care. So I mentioned briefly as it relates to the hormonal system, but completely aside from the hormonal system, you're going from being a person, let's say it's a first time mother, being a person who's had something growing inside of you that you're trying to support, to now for the first time in your life, you are a person who has a whole nother person that is completely dependent on you. So it is a really, really big change in not just your own personal relationship with that baby, but also in the way you relate to other people. It makes you reevaluate every other relationship. You have this new relationship that is a new way of looking at your life of, okay, well, how does this relationship compare? How does that relationship compare? And I know comparison is not the way that we should be approaching everything, but that is also what our mind kind of does. It's, you know, as much as the algorithm isn't great, our minds are also kind of an algorithm saying, okay, yes, I really like this. I like the feeling of being with my child. I also like the feeling of being with this person. They give me, you know, that warm safety feeling as well. This person doesn't make me feel safe when I'm around them. Okay, that's not a bad thing to be able to compare and be mindful about. Um, all right, Ruben's physiologic changes of purpurium. So, um, chapter 10, table 9.1. Sorry, I'm trying to find the table. All right, so on page 214 of your maternal newborn nursing and women's health textbook there is a summary of nursing assessments postpartum and it's the assessment as well as what should be anticipated um, as well as nursing interventions related so these are the um, general focus for what you should be looking at in a whole systems perspective there's these do focus on what's going to be affected by birth um, so it's not turn your blinders to everything else but when we have our list of important things to triage this is our list that we start with so breasts are they soft or engorged um, any alterations there's a couple of different interventions that we have but generally that's something that you would involve a lactation consultant with um, uterus uh, it, should be firm. You want to find the height of the uterus, which is something that we will either have a diagram for or you will be going over in clinicals. 
Um, but palpating the uterus is a very important part of postpartum assessment. I know I'm grabbing my imaginary uterus because I don't have one. <laughs> Um, but what you're doing is feeling to see, okay, how does that uterus feel? It's a ball of muscle tissue. So let's take, for example, I know this will be extra ridiculous because, again, not female anatomy. Um, but look at your bladder. This is something that all of you are familiar with, and I am too, whether or not you've had a baby. I'm sure all of you have held your bladder for too long at some point and then got into the bathroom and, oh my God, we're finally there let it all out and you can feel afterwards your bladder feels kind of the word that we use for it is boggy I know it's kind of a weird term but it's this tissue that's been surrounding the uh, fluid because there's been so much fluid it's been stretched out it's primarily muscle and epithelial tissue so yes it's stretchy it's elastic it will come back together but it's not a rubber band it doesn't snap back into place so I do not encourage you to do this all now. I encourage you to remember back and don't make yourselves hold your uh, pee for that long because it's not healthy. Um, but that feeling of your bladder just being kind of squishy or not really, you know, if you palpate your bladder when it's empty and you've just emptied it and had recently emptied it before, it feels like a tight ball. It's firm. You feel, okay, that's exactly where it is versus like, oh, okay, I can kind of squish it around a little bit. Um, same exact thing with a uterus. So you had a baby inside, and now you don't have a baby inside. Same exact deal, except, you know, multiply it by four or five times the volume, probably. Um, so what you're going to be palpating for is where is that uterus in its progression from I just had a baby to I'm just this tiny little ball of muscular tissue that sits right next to the bladder. Because normally, if you're not pregnant, your uterus is, what, the size of your thumb? It's very small. So we need to get that tissue that's stretched out to a balloon yeah, back down to something very, very small. And that doesn't mean that the, you know, the tissue has also grown, so it's not going to shrink back to a tiniest possible version of a uterus. There's going to be more time and more uterine lining to shed. Um, but yada, 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 that's the process that we're trying to achieve. You should also be checking for bladder distension. Um, and that's something that we can measure in multiple ways, but fluid will feel different. You can palpate a bladder and feel the firmness of a bladder. Like for example, I kind of need to pee. So we will be taking that break in just a couple of minutes. Um, so if you palpate that, you can also then differentiate, okay, here's the uterus. If you were to be palpating, for example, all of your own bladders right now, it's nowhere near as easy to palpate your uterus. It's hiding behind your bladder, good luck, and you're probably going to need some privacy if you actually want to accomplish that task. Um, all right, so let's say the fundus, uh, the uterus is boggy. What do we do? Fundal massage. What do you do when you have muscles that aren't working properly? You massage them out. You try and get them to reset and start doing what they're supposed to because our muscle tissues can get contracted in the wrong spots and those are all just knots, little balls of muscle tissue. But if they're not all contracting together, then you don't get the combined effect of this huge muscle tissue. All you get is a strand here, a strand here, a strand here, a knot here, and that's not what we want. All right, let's see, uh, so I know I mentioned it with the uterus, but bladder, that's essentially right after the uterus, that's our next thing that we're assessing. Um, bladder health is very important. I've talked about um, maintaining bladder health and using continence uh, or bladder schedules to maintain continence and the importance in the elderly. Well, guess what? It's not because they're elderly. It's because they have a compromised pelvic floor. And the same thing happens when you've just given birth. So we wanna make sure we're getting you on a toileting schedule, on a bathroom schedule. It's just to get your bladder in healthy shape. 
It's the same thing as trying to massage that uterus. We don't want to be stretching your bladder out and then putting extra pressure on the sphincters and all the other things that really need some time to relax right now. All right, bowels. So this is one thing that is an issue with a lot of women during birth is constipation. Um, if you haven't seen birth, it's also not unusual to see a little bit of bowel moving during the birthing process. I will tell you when I was seeing my first birth, it was a pro gynecologist that, or OBGYN that was delivering because she was just coaching that mom and the baby comes out and then, okay, oh yeah, wonderful, wonderful, wife, please. <laughs> Wiped. Oh, what a pro you are. Oh, it's amazing. Another one. Yes, you are. Mom didn't even know it happened. <laughs> Neither did dad because she had dad standing just out of view. So, oh, he could see the baby's head, but not where anything was below the baby. So what does that tell you? It happens a lot. That's something to be expected in the birthing process. Uh, you're bearing down and using a lot of those similar muscles. Um, but then the problem is also you're bearing down and using all of those similar muscles trying to push something out. Well, they're now all exhausted and they push something out and they're like, okay, we're done. This is what we were pushing it against. I'm and so wondering it, um, why the um, enema practice stopped because it was a the tender. postpartum enema. Yeah, I, I remember. It was awful, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Now I know why. <laughs> because the best thing to do is let the body do its thing and support it, but not hit it with, okay, let's push a bunch of fluid into the abdominal cavity. I mean, not into the cavity, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're pushing a whole bunch of fluid into this combined total space that we are actually trying to get back down. And it takes time, so it's going to take time. It's a gradual process. Um, but you can expect, like if you... Look at, okay, here's all your large intestines, your small intestines. You had something that was just pressing on all this, and that pressure was a part of what was pushing your um, fecal matter out of your bowels. Uh, I'm like trying to get the exact right words for it today. I don't know. Anyway, um, so you don't have that same pressure. Well, now it needs to exert its own pressure and it's been exerting its own pressure, but just like fighting to, you know, sustain its space while there's all this other stuff in here. So it takes a little time for the bowels to start moving regularly. Um, and that's why it becomes a part of your assessment. If it's something where you've done a cesarean birth, it's very important to be doing serial quadrant assessments, abdominal quadrant assessments. Um, otherwise, it's really just more important to be monitoring where she is on the process of going to passing her first stool after birth. Um, all right, Lokia, you should be observing for the character, amount, color, odor, and presence of clots. Anything that's coming out of her vaginal canal should be documented because if it's a lot of blood, it can kill her. So we need to be writing that down. So if it's a lot of blood, a lot of blood, a lot of blood, it's not going to be just written down or ignored. It's going to be a lot of blood. Oh God, we need to do something. Um, episiotomy. So this is something that she may or may not have had an episiotomy. If she did, that's something that you need to be monitoring. Um, depending on the degree of tearing, if it was a repair, or the degree of um, cutting through, if, uh, just depending, period. The degree of um, muscle tissue, whether it was torn or cut, will determine whether or not there's suturing or um, uh, the level of uh, kind of dressing that's involved. Uh, let's see, home and sign. <laughs> there's... This is something that we have much more limited evidence for now. Um, passive dorsiflexion of the foot is considered positive Hohmann sign. So what is that passive dorsiflexion of the foot? How do I do that on a patient? I've got my dummy patient right here. Tell me how I assess that. Point and flex their toes. And if it hurts and they start screaming, then they probably have a clot. So the patient says, ow, ow, ow. What does that mean? They probably like have a clot. <laughs> probably have a clot. Yes. So the evidence for Homan sign is more limited in the sense that it creates false negatives, false positives. So what I tell people is that is a great screening tool to then run a D-dimer. You can, oh, we have a positive Homan's test. Okay. Well, 
Let's run a stat D-dimer on this patient. It shouldn't take more than, I don't know, what, half an hour? Get him back pretty quick. Who's in the lab? How long does it take to run a D-dimer? Not very long. Not very long. There we go. <laughs> um, all right, so moving on to emotions or bonding with the newborn. Remember, what did I tell you? Unless you're assessing the baby or doing an active intervention on with the baby, the mom or the dad should be holding them. If the mom is busy with interventions, then dad should be holding them. If there's not dad present, then pick first degree family member that mom is closest with. It's that skin to skin bonding, establishing the family relationship that's more than just the genetics of, oh, half of you is the same as me. Um, so that will help significantly with postpartum depression. It's when we stop separating moms from their babies after, after the immediate postpartum period, postpartum depression through the floor. I mean, it's not like it's gone or anything. We didn't fix it, but we certainly fixed the chunk that we were causing by separating moms from their babies. So make sure that's a priority because it's a big effect on your um, patients. All right, and then finally, vital signs. Vital signs should be normal. You can expect a little bit of bradycardia, um, but generally speaking, what you're going to be really concerned about is what is her blood pressure, because that tells you are her essential organs getting enough oxygen. That's anytime you're having some really big experience with your patient. Let's say it's not a pregnant lady. Let's say it's me and I'm walking out and I don't look through the parking lot and there's some crazy guy who plows straight through me with his truck and you're all trying to keep me alive. What you're trying to do is keep oxygen moving through my vital organs. It's the same exact thing. It's just that the cause is different and so the setting is different, the perspectives are different. But at the end of the day, a woman who has just given birth, if she's not perfusing, she's going to have the same issues as any other patient who's going through a medical emergency. All right, and this is going to be our pause. So we've gone through a lot of the different body system changes and assessments from that table. Now, if you have your books, jump to page 221. And we've got these specific Rubens psychological changes. So we've talked about physiologic changes. Now, psychological changes, you have phase one, phase two, and phase three taking in, taking hold, and letting go. You said 221, right? Uh, yes, I, oh, is, am I gonna have a, an aneurysm because the pages are different? Uh, 223. 223, Brittany has saved the day and prevented a medical emergency in the classroom. Um, also, I think I chose the tie-dye shirt specifically because I just can't get too frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Thank you. All right. Um, so phase one, taking in. The mother is passive and willing to let others do things for her. Conversation center on the birth experience. Has interest in the newborn, but prefers that others care for her. Has little interest in learning. Focuses on need for food, fluids, and restorative sleep. Oh my God, I just got hit by a truck. Can you please make sure my child is well taken care of while I recover so I can take care of my child? It's that immediate postpartum period where you wanna be establishing healthy family supportive relationships. Remember when I talked about how motherhood is also partially moving from this, oh, I can do everything myself to it might not be best for my child if I do everything myself. That's not to say that that's what has to happen, should happen or does happen. Ideally, yes, that would be positive, but there are certainly parents out there who will stick it out themselves. It's just this is the general way your thoughts get pushed that most people start to go when they go through the birthing process. Next, you get the taking hold phase, which is when mom is, okay, I'm starting to feel like I am capable, I can do things. Well, then I am going to be taking an active role. I might be self-critical. I might be critical of others about the way they're taking care of my child. Now I have a lot more concern about my own self-care needs and the needs of the baby. And then finally, letting go 
is not letting go of their baby. This is not, stage three does not end when they're 18, 20, 25, God only knows. Ideally never, never let go of your children. Just develop your relationships into healthy adult parent-child relationships. No, this is letting go of what could have been. You will have a baby and it's not going to be the baby you thought you were going to have because everybody thinks of something, everybody anticipates something, and reality will always be different. You will think you will have one birthing experience, even if you're not, you know, you're not trying to put a ton of pressure on it. Oh, I think X, Y, and Z. You still have a birth plan. You still have kind of a general idea of where you think things will go. And maybe things follow that plan generally, but it's not always going to be 100%. There's going to be something that you didn't expect. And that's where we have that continuum of, oh, you know, there was one little thing I didn't expect to the birthing experience was completely different from everything I was anticipating. Um, so for somebody who is on that far end, farther end of the spectrum, this is going to be a difficult process for them. And this is going to be a big determinant of whether or not they move from postpartum blues into postpartum depression. Postpartum blues is essentially, can you reconcile the fact that your birthing experience was not what you anticipated? What was the difference? Was it a massive difference between the two? And then can you work through that using your own coping skills in a healthy way? Well, if you have a good nurse who's talking with you and trying to help guide you into thought patterns that are growth thought patterns, not rumination, not you know focusing on the negative, you can really help the mother to be looking at, oh, well, you know, that wasn't what we anticipated, but that's also in the past. And now you have your baby and you can start planning out the life that you want for your baby. You can take concrete action. You have so much more control over the life of your baby than you do over your birthing experience. Those are things that you can talk through. That's more just CBT. Think through it. Um, but those are things that you can do with your patient to help them work through these difficult challenges and have it be a post-traumatic growth experience rather than a post-traumatic stress experience or stress reaction. Um, all right, fatigue, both emotionally, physically, and psychologically is something that you should be anticipating. Period, stop, and expect them to be exhausted. There's a reason I keep using a metaphor of getting hit by a truck. It's not a physical, you know, their body systems are not getting physically traumatized as in whacked with stuff, but there is certainly tearing of muscle tissue regardless of the um, type of birth that's happening. It's a huge, huge, huge stress around the body. I sent the email. Thank you. So parenthood, essentially this is exactly what we're talking about. You're moving from being a person who's trying to take extra good care of yourself because you have another self in you to how do you take care of a whole extra person, ideally with a partner with you or with a social support system, family support system. So you're going to be moving into new roles. All right, who wants to dance on over to the adjunct office? Cool, Lauren, you're off next, thank you. Um, all right. And maybe we'll just move it on down the line if you're all good with that. Um, so parenthood, new roles, expectations, things are changing, your life is changing. New parents, it's going to be changing a lot more than a person who's having a second, third, fourth, eighth child. They're going to be like, yeah, we got this. We have the recipe for success, ideally. Uh, <laughs> there's like two ends of that eight child continuum. Um, all right, so feelings of ineptitude, again, first parent stuff, but second parent stuff. Just because they had a child before does not mean they know how to be a perfect parent. Don't expect that they remember every single thing from their first delivery. Oh, you've been here before? Okay, well, I don't need to help you. That's not the case. It's you're trying to give them the support that they need. You're assessing to see where they are. Maybe they remember some stuff. Use that to your advantage while you teach them. Um, but make sure you are a huge part in whether or not they have these feelings of ineptitude. So first time parents, they need a lot of teaching, a lot of teaching focused on the baby. Second time parents, 
a lot of the times they just need more teaching focused on getting through the trauma of the birthing process. So then they can get to this point where, oh yeah, we've done this before. We've raised a child. We've started this whole postpartum period. That's fine. It's the whole getting hit by a truck beforehand that's the hard part. So we're trying to help guide them through that. Uh, fatigue and irritability, very reasonable and should be expected for the next several months. Sense of loneliness. You've had a living being inside of you that is no longer inside of you. That's just a big emotional change. Um, parents should be identifying their own needs, setting priorities, and maintaining a sense of humor that is not a goal, that is an assessment. Um, that's something that you as a nurse, you can look at. What is their outlook? People use humor a lot of the times to communicate where they're at. The darker the humor, the more difficult a place they're in. You all know the yeah, healthcare worker, if you say, oh, this is the best day of my life, that's going to make me very concerned because it's, why are you having the best day of your life on a Wednesday when you're coming in and we're just mildly short-staffed and you've probably been stressed for a long time, right? That's not a best day of your life. That's a, oh, maybe this is the day where you finally crack. And I don't want anybody to finally crack. We want to be supporting people and getting them away from that period. Um, so look at their sense of humor. What are they joking about? Yes? Is that the same thing as when at the end of the day they're like, oh yeah, it'll be great. Is that similar to when they say it at the beginning of the day? Like handoff? Yeah. When they're saying like, oh yeah, it'll be great. That is just, <laughs> that's more sarcasm, like, I feel we're like. We're together again on Saturday, and you're like, oh yeah, it's going to be great. And you like walk away. I mean, working together and saying that's going to be great, I feel like that's a different thing, because I, I do get excited to be partnered up with different people at work, but... Um, really, it's the people that are like, oh, I'm living the dream. Well, they like just finished their cigarette and then came in to start their shift. They're not living the dream at the moment. And you want to be trying to support them a little more, not being throwing things at them. Not to throw judgment on any of us who may or may not be smoking and may or may not be trying to quit. All right. And no judgment on where anybody is in that process. All right, fathers, so engrossment and phases of adjustment. So the father did not get hit by a truck, but he did get hit by a whole truckload of responsibilities. Um, so it's going to be a big emotional change for him. The relationships in his life, especially first time parent, again, big changes, um, but they won't come along with the same physical changes. So this is somebody who you can lean a little bit more on, but you need to be mindful that they are going through their own mental and emotional stuff. Just because they don't have anything physical happening to their body doesn't mean they are your go-to, oh, they can be everything perfect support for the mom. Yes, there are going to be great supportive partners out there, but it's our job to be supporting and fostering that relationship, the supportive family relationships as well not just leaving it off to the family system. Um, so four phases of adjustment, pretty darn similar to Ruben's phases. They're going to have their own expectations and personal intentions. Then they will have to confront the reality of their child and overcome frustrations related to here is what you get, whether or not you want it. This is dice has been rolled. Here is the roll of the dice. Here is what you receive as a result. Um, so similar to the mother's process it takes a little bit of oh anticipation versus reality um, creating one's own personal father role this is a big one especially first time or young fathers um, that they are trying to reconcile their own personal relationships with their fathers what do they see fatherhood as did they have a father who is very involved a father who is maybe less involved more absent a father who prioritized working and supporting the family and so the mom was able to stay home and raise them but you know that doesn't mean that they weren't contributing to the family but that also means that they weren't necessarily physically available so you start to see oh well do i want that to be my role do i want to be the person that's just you know out trying to accomplish tasks for the family or do i want to be in taking care of the family too and those are things that you really have to start asking yourself and ideally you ask yourself with your partner before you have your child 
while you're going through this pregnancy process. The more they do that, the more it's easy to adjust into those roles because it's not a surprise of, okay, well, now that we're back home, I'll run off to work. Like if that's the first time you've had that conversation and the mom thinks that you're going to be spending the next month, you know, taking paternity leave and you're thinking you're going to spend the next month working 80 hours so you can stash as much money for the baby as possible. Those are two very different value sets. I'm not saying one is right or wrong. They're different. And the parents need to understand those and work through those so they don't hit each other head on head when they come to a head. Um, all right, reaping the rewards of fatherhood. So yeah, if you're a good parent, life is better. It's nice to have children that want to talk to you. And it is what it is if, you know, parenthood is rough, like life is rough. Like with my own parents, you all probably have gotten a decent kind of guess at what my relationship is with them. But at the end of the day, they are just people that have had their lives shaped by their own parents, trying to do their best and trying my best to not hold them, you know, too accountable for all these different things that maybe weren't all their responsibility or weren't all their ability. So it's, again, those are the kinds of things that we might think that, oh, this is a mother baby thing happening, but it's also an iteration of that generational family cycle of you have that moment of this father is dealing with their parents' relationship. This mother is dealing with her relationship with her parents when she's having this child and shaping, oh, what do I want my relationship with my child to be? How is she taken care of? It's the same exact thing. All right, other family members. <laughs> we all know about the first child sibling that's all angry that now we have the second child. Um, you've seen Nova around. She's got her little sister that hates her and loves her so much. Um, the age is probably the biggest factor um, on how the older sibling will respond other than, than how the parents shape that relationship. So if you have one year old, they're not going to be all jealous of this new baby because they've barely gotten object permanence. They're not really all that cognizant of what a baby is. Um, they will be understanding what they are themselves within hopefully the next year or so and starting to reconcile that with the world around them. So you have that and, oh, I've got a little buddy that I'm going through the world with versus someone who's maybe four, five, six, and they are the center of their entire existence. Like they just figured out that they exist and there's this whole world around them that also exists, but it exists so they can figure it out. And now there's this whole other extra thing that gets all this attention and work and you don't get to just roam around and do your own thing. So it's a very, very different change in the uh, family dynamic for somebody who's, you know, four or five, six. Now, fast forward someone who's 10 or 11. Oh, I'm getting older. I'm a, I'm a big kid. I can take care of myself. Yeah, you can. You, yeah, my mom takes care of the baby and I can take care of me and my mom. I can make us soup or you know do some easy task that's when you're starting to get things where a kid would want to buy in and feel like oh they are also a part of raising it's you're giving them responsibilities based on where they are in their own growth cycle and then finally you've got the teenager who really depending on their maturity level might be like oh my god i've got this baby kid isn't this so cool yeah i got a little baby sibling or just like yeah cool i got a baby sibling i'll see you guys tonight and that's really you know, where they're at. Um, grandparents, that one's again, more familial and also cultural. Are they of a culture where they are bringing family in or are they of a cultural view where maybe they are more, oh, I just want me, I just want my partner. Um, honestly, if you can encourage any other family involvement from a reportedly healthy family system, like unless they're saying my parents are toxic, don't call them. You know, we want to be encouraging support. Together, everyone achieves more. Team, yay! I get it, it's, you know, it's silly, yada, yada, yada. But you all just spent half an hour at the start of the day talking about how you are able to cope with a lot more because you all lift each other up. It's not a joke, it's just subtle. Um, so those grandparents, if you can involve them, that's huge. 
All right, grieving parents, therapeutic communication. We've gone through the stages of grief. Um, you don't always experience them in a specific order, but you generally experience all of them at some point to some degree. You'll experience some to a stronger degree than others, a lot of the times based on your coping strategies and your thought patterns. Um, but this is on the list of like worst things that can happen. This is pretty much on the, on the top of the list. And there is literally a list to score like traumatic recent experiences um, and it is either number one or number three. I don't remember which. Uh, data collection, family care plan. So we've talked already a lot about this. You're, you are trying to have facilitated conversations with the patient and their family about what's going on in their life and their ability to take care of this baby. If you're an OB nurse at NIH, be familiar with the local resources. You could say, oh, this is an issue. Okay, well, this is who you should reach out to. That's one of the biggest parts of the OB process is being able to help them navigate care. Make sure they're not just floating out in the ether. All right, now we'll talk about caring for the newborn, weaning. Well, that happened real fast. I'm guessing I'm not going to have a... What happened really fast? Uh, my laptop is...